Can we please uh, put our hands together and give a huge round of applause? Welcome to Steve Cavalier. Hello to the birthplace of television. Um, I'm Stephen Cavalier, an animator and writer, and I'm going to talk to you about Harry Smith. That's him there with some illegible scrawl by his friend Alan Ginsberg, but I'm sure it's very poetic. Um, and how it all started was 10 years ago I wrote this book. Um, I'm not really a historian, so it was a, a huge voyage of discovery for me, and I wanted to put strange and interesting things in the book that weren't in other animation history books. So this is how I discovered Harry Smith, and he blew my mind. There's the book. That's the American one, that's, that's the British one. That one's nice. One. Um, so I like his early films, sorry, his early films, because they are beautiful, intricate, and hypnotic, because each one of the thousands of frames could be framed and put on the wall of a gallery. I'll just show you a bit of this one. Uh, he, he did them to music, but I'll turn that off so that I can carry on talking. Um, he used an amazing, intricate technique to do these, which I haven't really got time to explain, but I can in the question bit if you want. Um, yeah, so that's that. And. Um, I was, and most of all, I was fascinated by the incredible Harry Smith himself. I really think I hit the strange and interesting jackpot when I uncovered this guy. Um, his story illustrated to me how if you uncompromisingly follow the path of your creative interests, you can leave your mark on the world. Um, at times, this may sound like a, a crazy beatnik character dreamed up by the mighty Bush or Ricky Gervais or someone, but I'm not making any of this up. Possibly Harry made some bits of it up, because that's the sort of thing Harry did. But, um, so his two best known occupations were animator and curator of folk music. I know that isn't the most interesting start, but bear with me. He was also an important painter and a collector of all kinds of crazy things. And he was also a magician. And I'm not talking about a few party tricks, I mean like full-on weird spells. Um, so therefore, because Harry Smith produced major work in all these different disciplines and had a common name, this meant that people reading about Harry Smith's painting, for instance, uh, may have no idea he's also the animator Harry Smith and no idea that he's the same Harry Smith who curated seminal compilations of rare folk music talking of the compilations. So the, the animation is amazing, the painting is great, the magic is insane, the collections are unique, but the folk music thing is perhaps his most famous work. And that's this, the Anthology of American Folk Music. Um, that's, that's the cover of one of the, uh, of one of the, the albums in there. Um, it comes with all this, all this amazing stuff inside, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, so, um, so, so to, to collect this stuff, he, he hitched all around the USA on the back of trains and hitchhiking and stuff, visiting old musicians in log cabins, archiving and putting together maybe the most important collection of folk and outsider music. Described as ground zero of rock and roll, in its release form this became a huge influence on musicians like Bob Dylan, Led Zeppelin, Grateful Dead, Lou Reed, Nick Cave and many others who have plundered the contents. So this, uh, this is the amazing pamphlet you get with it, which, is, which was put together by Harry himself. All the design and the writing and stuff, he goes into great detail about each track, who the people were, where they lived, you know, etc., etc. It really is a beautiful thing. Um, you can see some of it. That, 
that's a version of it that he's annotated himself for somebody, customised. Um, here's, here's a page from him. Uh, there's another page. That's great because that guy's called Furry Lewis, which I like. And um, you also get this, this book with all these amazing essays. Um, there's another page. This is one of the essays that's in here. It's really great. Um, and this is a sticker thing that I got on it. And, and the, with, on the picture of this, I believe, is him drinking his, um, his famous, his favourite concoction. Oh, I forgot something. Wait a minute. I forgot to put that, I forgot to put that there. And I forgot to put these out. So you aren't feeling the magic yet. That's better, I can feel it improving now. <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Yes, so that's his, his favourite concoction, which is Beer and milk, I believe that's what he's drinking there, so cheers. Yeah. It's an acquired taste. Um, <clears throat> so, with the collections, another manifestation of his archiving, Harry's incredible collections of objects included thousands of Ukrainian Easter eggs, native tapestries, which you can see there, Paper planes found on the streets, string figures, things shaped like other things, like spoons shaped like ducks, bags shaped like apples, anything shaped like a hamburger. This is the kind of stuff he, he collected. Uh, this is a um, video. Harry talking about his collection of Ukrainian Easter eggs from Sing Out magazine. I've gone through a So there you can see his Ukrainian Easter eggs, some of them at least. I mean, I can see why he collected them, they're great. Um, there's some more of his collections. Uh, so, magic, um, described by Kenneth Anger as the world's greatest magician, he derived a lot of his spells from the Indian rituals he had witnessed as a child and from the writings of Alistair Crowley. Smith was said to have helped many people with his magic, from the rich and famous who courted his friendship to the street people he associated with. This picture here, um, it look, this is him, this is the young Harry Smith with, with some Native American Indians. It looks like he's DJing and they're dancing, but actually it's completely the other way around. That's his primitive recording equipment that he would carry around all over America, I presume, and he's recording their music onto the, onto the acetate there. Um, so that's what's going on there. Um, so, his frequent magic included such bizarre acts as leaving semen and blood on display at his screenings to absorb audience energy. <laughs> so you can see why I did that. Uh, <laughs> perhaps this was to counteract the crowd reaction provoked by his habit of aggressively berating audience members he considered insufficiently attentive. So watch out, I've got my eye on you lot. All these activities led to him being credited as being a big influence on 1960s psychedelia. Among, amongst his friends were um, celebrities and artists as diverse as Ke Charlie Parker, Eliz Elizabeth Taylor, Kenneth Anger, Patti Smith and Allen Ginsberg, while he simultaneously hung out with the homeless and addicts he encountered and treated a lot of them on equal terms. 
Although said to be generous with what little money he had, Smith chose to live as a bum with no income, relying on benefactors and scrounging bits of money here and there, which he would invariably spend on books, music, alcohol, and other recreational substances, rather than boring things like food or rent. So his early life, it's hard to get a grip on the truth of a life story that's been so mythologized, not least by the man himself. His family were highly unconventional and encouraged his interest in philosophy, alternative religion and the occult. Although Smith was at one point claiming his mother was Romanov Grand Duchess Anastasia of Russia, you can see why I need notes, she was in fact Mary Louise Hammond, a teacher on the Lummi Indian Reservation, which was that picture before. So, so they lived on, on the Indian Reservation and he, he would hang out with the Indians for a lot of his teenage years, for a lot of his young years. Smith claimed his father gave him a blacksmith kit when he was 12 and set in the standard childhood task of converting lead into gold. <laughs> As a teenager, he would often sleep at the Indian Reservation where his mother worked. Here he would make recordings of Native American music and rituals. Maybe I've gone a bit too far forward. Uh, this was the beginning of his music archives and his interest in magic. An important, an important moment in the young Smith's life uh, seemed to be 1944 when he attended a Woody Guthrie concert and smoked pot for the first time. He immediately dropped out of college, moved to San Francisco for, for a bohemian lifestyle, and never looked back. So here he is a bit older, <coughs> living his best bohemian life. Um, contrary to popular belief, however, bohemian isn't a word for bone idol, as Smith's incredible body of work would demonstrate. There he is again. So, this, so his painting, he started out as a painter in San Francisco's jazz quarter in the, of the 1950s. He befriended such musicians as Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, and he attempted to capture their music on canvas. Um, so here you can see lots of his different um, painting in which he, he tries to convey, you know, they're very pattern based, like music has a rhythm and a pattern. So you can kind of see that with his paintings. Some of them are more scattered than others, like that looks like a wild piece of jazz. Um, they're very kind of from the abstract impressionist era, so they've, you know, they've got that kind of feel to them. And then you can see the stuff about the, the, the American Indian culture creeping into it as well. The, the sort of native designs and stuff. Uh, and he did other mad things like this is all done on a typewriter. Sorry, this is all done on a typewriter. Um, so, yeah, it's very, very inventive. Uh, so his animation, these are some frames from that, you know, that, that, that piece I showed you before and other similar pieces. So as you can see, you can take any frame and put it in a, sorry, any, yeah, any frame of the animation, put it in a frame and put it on a wall, you know, in a gallery, and it would look amazing. So, like his painting, Smith's animation had influences drawn from Eastern religion and the American Indian culture of his childhood. Inspired, inspired by his friend, the veteran abstract animator Oscar Fischinger, who after the war had fled to San Francisco, he fled to America and ended up in San Francisco, and also the films of Len Lai and Norman, Norman McLaren, painted directly onto film stock, Smith created some of the 20th century's most beautiful and remarkable abstract films. Oops. Um, Smith's early films were often made as a visual response to the great jazz artists of the time, such as Gillespie, Parker, Thilon, always have difficulty with this, Thilonius, Monk, and Chet Baker. This isn't the ideal... Um, situation with me, because I'm not very good at actually saying words, but anyway, I'm going to get my best shot. Uh, later, Smith would screen this work in the nightclubs of San Francisco, where these same musicians would in turn create their music in response to the films. So he would, he, create, he created animation in response to the music, and then he would project the animation, and then the musicians would create music in response to the animation. 
you can see an article about it down there. So Smith's working methods, enhanced by various intoxicants, are said to be a, said to have been a form of sinus again a word I'm not very good at synesthesia, the phenomenon the phenomenon of overlapping senses such as seeing sounds as colours and of images triggering internal sensations of sound. During this process, Smith often used, to, often used sleep deprivation as a gateway to spirituality and the subconscious, a process of falling asleep, awaking and resuming work continuously next to his camera. In Smith's words, this was to make the whole thing automatic. Some kind of universal process was directing these so-called arbitrary processes. This technique is actually very commonly practiced by many a late night animator, mm -hmm. except by accident. <laughs> um, his, his most famous work, perhaps, came in 1960, having, having taken about 10 years to make. The mysterious spiritual cutout epic film called Film Number 12, or nicknamed Heaven and Earth Magic. He, he just called his films numbers, and other people, in order to remember which number was which, they would, you know, describe. So this got called Heaven and Earth Magic. Smith gave a typically mysterious summary of the narrative of the film as follows. The first part depicts the heroine's toothache consequent to the loss of a very valuable watermelon, her dentistry and transportation to heaven. The second part depicts the return to Earth from being eaten by Max Muller on the day Edward VII, no sorry, yeah, VII, dedicated the Great Sewer of London. So that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Um, according to Smith, the original of Heaven and Earth Magic had a running time of six hours, although if this existed it now seems lost. Um, is it, there's a bit of it here, and I'm not going to show you six hours, don't worry. So it was six hours of that kind of thing. Um, so, um, if the visuals in this disappoint compared to the richness, richness of his early work, it should be remembered that it was designed to be enhanced with colour color filters, lights, music, sound effects and framing masks manipulated by Smith at, at the screenings. So it was almost like a live show where he would, in front of the film, he'd be doing all kinds of stuff. Also featuring in men, many of his legendary screenings was a whole other theatre of activity with Smith performing magic spells, letting off fireworks, giving a running stream of consciousness commentary while fending off hecklers and upset members of the audience. That probably came about five and a half hours into it, I'm guessing. After one particularly irksome screening, Smith threw the projector out of a third story window onto Park Avenue South. Don't worry, I won't try and attempt to recreate any of this, especially as we're on ground, ground floor level. After this, Smith would spend years developing even more ambitious film projects. Um, he spent much of the 1960s trying to complete his unique mystical version of Wizard of Oz, entitled Film Number 13, Oz, aka the Magic Mushroom People of Oz. <laughs> Smith, Smith raised a budget for this, which he later claimed to be a million and a half dollars from a group of patrons, including Elizabeth Taylor. After a year, when the investors inquired about progress, they discovered Smith had produced only nine minutes of usable film. Shortly after that, the main financier died of a drug overdose, or possibly in shock at how his money had disappeared, and the others pulled the plug. Smith was locked out of the studio, and most of the work was destroyed. What Remains was edited with other material to form subsequent films. The first part of film number 16, Oz the Tin Woodsman's Dream, for instance, which is this, shows glimpses of the amazing film that never was. So it's really rather well, lovely. <coughs> Thank you.
Um, his next film was called Mahogany, film number 18, Mahogany. It took Smith another 10 years. For this, for this film, Smith, as ambitious as ever, intended cr to create a new film language. He used live action and animation and filmed many scenes in the Chelsea Hotel in New York, where he now lived, featuring friends like Allen Ginsberg, Jonas Meckes and Patti Smith, as well as random homeless people he befriended. Apparently this film was originally intended to be shown on the tops of four billiard tables enclosed in a boxing ring. I'm not making this up. Um, so this, there he is, planning the new film language for the film, I'm guessing. Um, this is a diagram of the billiard tables and the boxing ring, I think. Very lovely diagram. Um, so, what you, may be, what you may be wondering is how he managed to live an, an itinerant lifestyle while in possession of 3,000 Ukrainian Easter eggs, and that was just one of his many collections. Well, that's just one of the many Harry Smith mysteries. Maybe it was magic, or maybe he had, he had very understanding friends with lots of storage space. Anyway, later in life, he settled in the famously bohemian Chelsea Hotel, New York. Visitors, visitors to the hotel never knew what to expect, what chaos might ensue, or what mood Smith might be in. The hotel's most eccentric residents often hung out there, as well as celebrated artists, the local drug dealers, assorted sycophants, and runaway teenagers, whom Smith recorded reading out desperate letters from their parents. Visitors were forbidden to touch anything in his room. His precious collections were on orderly display, stacked from floor to ceiling, alongside beer cans, unemptied ashtrays, with his pet parakeets flying around the room. And part of this documentary, I don't know who he is, um, just after this. Uh, this is all on YouTube, this documentary, by the way, it's great. So now, this is in the Chelsea Hotel. Well, that is. So there's his room. And you can see in his room what I've just described um, the chaos of his collections, his books. I mean, in a hotel room, how, do you, how can you. How is that allowed? <coughs> I guess it was one of those kind of hotels where you just lived in forever. So, um, so when Oscar Fishinger's wife, widow, Elfried, came to visit Harry there, she told him of how many of her husband's precious works hadn't been properly preserved. Harry disappeared into his paraphernalia, returned with a few strange items, and proceeded to perform a ritual, chanting, dancing around, and sacrificing a live chicken, apparently. Soon after this, Elfried received several grants to preserve the work, so Harry's magic seemed to have worked. Smith's existence as a bum eventually caught up with him. He had exhausted his credit at Chelsea Hotel, the hospitality of his friends like Ginsburg, and subsisted in ho homeless hostels, toothless and unable to ingest solid food. He mainly survived on his favourite concoction, a mixture of beer and milk. Cheers. <laughs> Not finished. <laughs> that was a very hopeful clap, wasn't it? No, it's nearly finished, don't worry. Even in his Bowery flop house, he continued his archive recordings, making audio tapes of different snoring sounds and the sounds of dying men. Eventually, Ginsburg once more took pity on him, on him and took him in again to stay in his apartment. He, la he later got rid of him by giving, fixing him up with a job with a, with a teaching job in, in Colorado, which I think is what that is. Harry came back to New York to accept an award in 1991, decamped once more at the Chelsea Hotel and never left. In 1992, Smith died of cardiac arrest in the Chelsea Hotel, singing in his friend Paola Igliori's arms. 
Poet and writer Igliori later made American Magus, a documentary about Smith's life, which I've shown you some clips of, which is on YouTube. Perhaps related back to when his dad asked him to create gold from lead, Harry's work was a kind of alchemy. He translated the ordinary into something beautiful, and in doing so took himself on the audience on a spiritual journey, because alchemy is both physical and spiritual. Through his vocations of artistic collage and collecting, he was in a way communicating patterns of information. In his words, the type of thinking that I apply to the records, I apply to other things, like Seminole patchwork or Ukrainian Easter eggs. It's a way of flipping quickly through, of reprogramming the mind. Smith believed these patterns can uncover powerful fundamental truths which have the power to change society. As an elderly Smith said at his award acceptance speech in 1991, I'm glad to say my dreams came true. I've seen America change through music. Thank you.